Okay, I think we can get started. Uh, for those of you who know me, I'm Jay Murian. Um, I'm an oncologist, but my skill sets evolved over the years of talking to patients who didn't want to hear things that I had to tell them. And so I do a lot of talks on communication and difficult conversations. And this is one that I thought we needed to focus on, and that's dealing with conflict, difficult patients, and difficult colleagues. How many of you have had conflict with patients or colleagues? Almost everybody. So another way of talking about this is saying, how do we navigate the turbulence that we can expect to encounter? So I want to be able to recognize and deal with conflict as it unfolds. If you wait until you've got full-blown conflict and you're angry, you've waited too long. You need to recognize it as it's evolving. You need to understand the structure of conflict so that you can see where you're headed wrong or where you might correct it and learn the skills for attempting to create alignment when opinions differ. So I started off this talk when I was preparing it and I decided I was going to title it Dealing with the Problem, Hateful or Difficult Patient. And then I asked myself, is this really the best way to think of such encounters? Or do I need a reset? And I came up with, yes, I need a reset, that this is not the way to deal with it. What's the problem with the way I'm dealing with it here in this first title? Yeah, I'm blaming the patient. The patient's a problem patient, a hateful patient, or a difficult patient. And so I decided I needed to get rid of that title, and we should avoid terms that are punitive, blame assigning, and or confrontational adjectives. And we might remember confirmation bias. How many of you have been told to go see a certain patient, and before you go see the patient, you are told, oh, this is a drug-seeking patient, this is a difficult patient, this is a hateful patient. You walk in the room and you've got confirmation bias. You walk in the room with your arms across the chest saying, so why did you come to the emergency room today? You've already started off with an attitude because somebody labeled that patient. So we should not label patients. Since it takes two to tango, we should acknowledge that the relationship is actually what's challenging or difficult it's not the patient that's challenging or difficult. It's our relationship with them. So that's why I decided to change the title of this talk. Instead of saying difficult patient encounters, I put the hyphen between patient and encounters because I'm talking about the encounter that's difficult. So it's a difficult patient encounter. And in the study in the archives of internal medicine, when physicians were surveyed, one out of six Outpatient visits is uh, considered to be difficult, time-consuming, and unprofessionally uh, or professionally unsatisfying. And it has been said in this paper, perpetual conflict and recurring unsatisfying visits have been associated with compassion fatigue and burnout. And the problem with difficult patient encounters, if you don't know how to deal with them, is that 90% of your time may be spent on the 10% of your difficult patients. But we also deal with colleagues, and sometimes our communication with colleagues is difficult. And again, I won't blame it on the colleague. I'll just say it's a difficult colleague encounter. And we all know about the hidden curriculum. That's the lessons that are learned even though we never intend to teach them. It's what we witness versus what we are told. We're told to be compassionate. Um, we're told to, do, uh, to be respectful of people, and then the uh, students or residents find us yelling at each other. And actually this made it to the uh, New York Times. Michael Sakaris is an oncologist and he wrote an article about his experience in training and he titled it When the Bully is the Doctor. Um, and we've all seen, depending on, in medicine maybe not as much in some of the surgical subspecialties, it has been part of the culture to uh, call people out in front of their peers um, and embarrass them. Uh, and it's not just that it makes the resident or student feel bad. It can be dangerous for patients because if I start my next encounter with a patient and I'm already beating up on myself, I'm distracted. So that's why this other article talked about that bullying of trainee doctors is a patient safety issue as well. 
And it's not just doctors. Nurses have been accused of eating their young. 65% um, of nurses surveyed by the American Nurse Today have witnessed some form of nursing incivility. And I like this comment. If patients can expect kind and courteous bedside manner from their care providers, why can't nurses count on other nurses? So we have difficult patient encounters and difficult colleague encounters, and our job is to replace the piece of the puzzle that is now labeled conflict with a way to prevent or minimize that conflict. Now, this is the way some people learned to deal with conflict early on, kind of demanding respect. Well, that never worked for me, so I always defaulted to my way of dealing with conflict, which was this and I always focused on step three the most. But there's got to be a better way. It can't always be my way, your way, or the highway. It's got to be, there's got to be a better way. And the first thing I mentioned is, uh, in my introduction, is you got to recognize conflict as it begins to unfold, which means you have to have your antenna up you need to be looking for it, because if you wait until you're already angry and the patient's already angry or your colleague's already angry, you've waited too long. So you need to look for the signs and symptoms of evolving conflict. Have you ever found yourself going into a circular conversation? You say something, the patient says something, you say the same thing again, they say the same thing again. And once you recognize, hey, I've been here before, I think I just said this and I'm saying it again, you're probably in conflict. Or if you have a defensive, um, aggressive body language. If you watch your colleagues, you can tell when they're in conflict with the patient, even if you walk by the room, because they're likely doing this kind of stuff. Leaning back, what does that mean? Versus leaning in. If I'm leaning in, I'm wanting to connect with you. If I'm leaning back, it says, I, I don't want to be here. Um, and that's a good sign that you can recognize that you're in conflict. Sarcasm, rude behavior, uninvited criticism, your own sense of unease, threat, anger, and frustration are all good signs that you're entering into the uh, zone of conflict. So what should you do when you recognize conflict? Well, you want to mentally step back and consider the options. Oops. And that's avoid or, conf or confront, right? Those are your only options, aren't they? Well, not really. Are there other options other than avoidance and confrontation available? If we try to avoid the conflict, we might feel taken advantage of. We're going to ruminate on it all day. I let them get away with this. And then our feelings are likely to erupt at an inopportune time. On the other hand, if we confront conflict, we might make things worse. We might not win. And we might suffer unintended consequences of picking a fight with someone. Now, many of us will imagine that you're born, this is a Thomas Kilman conflict mode, that you're born either assertive or unassertive, and you're born either uncooperative and cooperative, and you better just deal with who you are. However, we know that emotionally intelligent adults can adjust their assertiveness and cooperativeness styles so as to choose their battles. And if you choose to be assertive and uncooperative, you're in a competitive mode. If you're assertive and cooperative, you're collaborating. If you're unassertive and uncooperative, you're avoiding. And if you're cooperative and unassertive, you're accommodating. And if you're in the middle, you're compromising. Now, when, what does that look like? In the competitive mode, you're trying, you're being assertive and uncooperative. You want to satisfy your needs above that of the other person. If you're collaborating, you're trying to find a win-win solution that will satisfy both parties' concerns. When you're compromising, it's said when you compromise, nobody gets everything of what they wanted. You try to find an acceptable solution that only partially satisfies both parties' concerns. If you're avoiding it, you are sidestepping the conflict without trying to satisfy either party's concerns. And when you accommodate, you try to satisfy other person's concerns at their own expense, and you're accommodating. 
How many of you think all of these are valid strategies at certain times? They are. There are times you should avoid conflict, and there are times you should give in, and I'll kind of give you some examples. So when do we want to be assertive <coughs> and uncooperative, i.e. competitive? <coughs> when you're dealing with an emergency and tough decisions have to be made. We know that when there's always a captain of the code team, right? There's the leader of the code. When decisions have to be made quickly, you have to have one captain. You can't have debates and arguments when decisions have to be made quickly. You recognize the authority figure and let that person call the shots. They may be right, they may be wrong, <clears throat> but if you don't acknowledge that that person's the lead person. So if you are the code leader, you have to be assertive and uncooperative. When do you collaborate? Well, that's when time is available, when there are multiple parties, and when you can sense there might be a win-win. We can all get what we want. That's a good time to collaborate. Compromise is when a quick solution is needed and a short-term solution is appropriate. It's kind of kicking the can down the road. Nobody gets 100% of, of what they want. You can think of our government in recent years, the number of shutdowns we've had, and how do they resolve it? Do they actually fix the problem? No, they kick it down the road and say, we're going to fund the government for another two months and we'll bring it up again. They're kind of compromising. Nobody's getting what they want, but they've decided to put it off the table right now. When is it important to avoid? Well, it's when the issue is unimportant and engaging would waste valuable time. If my wife texted me right now, I could look at my watch and see what she's texting. And if she texted me and said, I'm upset with you, you left the towel on the shower floor again, I'm probably not going to respond. I'm going to avoid it right now because I'm giving grand rounds. It's not proper for me to deal with that right now. So I will choose to avoid that, say this is not the time to have that conflict. And accommodating is when you want to be generous or more likely when you want a favor in the bank. How do you want, decide you want a favor in the bank? Well, let's pretend like Dr. Scarborough, I know he loves chocolate ice cream. He loves chocolate ice cream. And I could care less. I like both vanilla and chocolate. But we're going to Baskin Robbins, and here he says, I want to go where there's good chocolate ice cream. Even though I don't care, I might not tell him that. I might say, well, I kind of wanted vanilla, but we'll, we'll do it your way, David. We'll go get chocolate ice cream, but you owe me a favor now. So, so in that situation, accommodation might get you what you want. So you've decided to be cooperative and unassertive. You're not asserting your needs. So a toolkit for decoding conflict is always important. I said you should notice when you're in conflict. Most conflicts share common structures with very similar building blocks. And I don't care if it's conflict with a patient, with a colleague, with your spouse, your significant other, or your neighbor. They have several con uh, ma uh, components in common. First is disagreement about what happened or what will happen. Feelings play a big part of conflict. Um, it's when emotions muddy the water and you get into the point where you forgot what your mother told you about counting to 10 before you speak because of amygdala hijacking. When you get emotional, your emotional brain gets to the cortex before your rational brain and you say things that you wished you hadn't said. And then there's this vulnerable sense of identity. So there are three components to conflict that are likely to be playing out simultaneously. And it's really, when you're dealing in conflict, you're dealing with those three conversations at once. And the reason it's good to know about these, you have to decode in real time. You have to say that statement the patient just made or that statement my colleague just made, where's that coming from? The statement I just made to my patient or to my colleague, where's that coming from? So the general structure, as we said, the what happened conversation, the feelings conversation, and the identity conversation. And each, in each of these areas, we often make predictable errors that distort, distort the conversation. Let's start with the what happened conversation. Who said or did what? Disagreements about what happened or what should happen. 
And it's obviously cognitively focused. This isn't dealing with emotions, it's dealing with cognitive facts. This is what I believe happened, this is what I believe will happen. But conflict is fueled by errors due to those assumptions. The truth assumption. Not recognizing that the same facts can be associated with different interpretations, other stories, and different points of view. Now, I, don't, I know we're not supposed to talk about politics, but I am going to bring up Kellyanne Conway when she made the comment that there are alternative facts. The media jumped all over that, but I think I knew what she was saying. I don't think she was saying there are alternative facts, and I'm not a supporter of hers. I, I'm just trying to be objective. When she said there are alternative facts, I think she meant there are alternative ways to look at the facts. But she said it in a way to make it sound like you can make up your own facts. So we know that, that the same facts can be interpreted with different interpretations and different points of view. Um, Dr. Morris helped me with this. He sent me this slide, recognizing other points of view. Stormtroopers actually look friendly if they wear their helmets upside down, don't they? And let's try to see things from all angles, moving from either or to both. Let's do an experiment. I need everybody to put their hand above their head. Okay, look up at your finger. Get it going in a clockwise direction. I'll be very careful not to change the direction. Keep it going. But now, Gradually lower, lower your hand to eye level. Keep going. Now go down to your breast level and look down. Are you still going clockwise? Are you? Do it again then. <laughs> go. You're now going counterclockwise. You haven't changed the direction of your hand. You've changed your perspective of how you look at it. If you're looking at it from below, you're going clockwise. If you're looking at it from below, you're going counterclockwise. So that's an example of how the facts didn't change, but the interpretations changed based on your point of view. And I like that cartoon. That kind of says it again. <clears throat> so. We have this truth assumption, and we tend to think that our view is more common than it really is. And we believe that if others are rational, they should just simply agree with us. And if you buy this uh, assumption, the solution is always simple. Just convince them. So say it again. Say it more clearly. Say it louder. And if they don't get it, it must be their fault, right? And we've all witnessed that these circular conversations where it just keeps getting louder and louder. So let's look at an example. A family requests a feeding tube for their dying mother. There are two facts, but they can be interpreted differently. One fact is that mom is dying, and the other fact is mom is not eating. Okay, those are the facts. But I hope you agree there can be different interpretations. Mom is dying because she stopped eating? Or mom stopped eating because she's dying? Both are consistent with the facts that she's dying and she's not eating. But your interpretation will change what you want to do. So if mom is dying because she stopped eating, then the family may be correct that a feeding tube in certain situations may be appropriate. However, if mom stopped eating because she's dying, a feeding tube will cause complications without reversing the dying process. So we have the same facts, but the family's interpreting it one way, we're interpreting it another way, we're in conflict. Now since the same facts can be interpreted differently, you have to be curious. And it's also respectful. It shows them that off the bat you're not trying to compete with them. You're not trying to uh, have conflict. So you can say to them, could you share with me why you think mom stopped eating? Get them to think about it. Offer other, they might say she stopped eating because she's depressed. Okay, you can offer other information as an alternative. 
you raise some important concerns. Be respectful. May I share with you my thoughts and then say, because also, if mom's GI tract isn't working because she has this ileus from neuropathy and prior chemotherapy drugs and her liver is not functioning, she's not going to be able to metabolize food. Her body already senses that putting force feeding her is going to make her sick. You can try to do that after you've first been respectful and listen to their concerns. And recognize that you can't resolve the chicken and egg question by interrupting with yeah, but statements. And that's what we do. When the family goes, oh, mom's just depressed, yeah, but. Um, don't ever do yeah, but. We also know that on top of the truth assumption, there's the intent assumption. There are two six-letter words that both start with I, and they get confused all the time, and they're both responsible for a lot of conflict, impact versus intent. So if I walk in the room and the family says, why doesn't my mom have a feeding tube? Are you going to let her starve to death? What is the impact that I'm feeling, likely? I'm feeling challenged, right? I'm feeling that my authority as a physician is being questioned. And I might strike back at that family member. But was that their intent to challenge me? Do we know? Maybe they just want to know. What's our strategy? Why does a mom have a feeding tube? Are we just going to let her starve to death? But it's very likely that I will focus on the impact of how it made me feel than um, what I actually said or what she actually said. <clears throat> I could be late coming. I could call my wife and say, I'll be, I'm leaving now. I'll be home in 20 minutes. But as I step out the door, Dr. Abrio happens to be walking down the hall, and he says, oh, can I bounce a patient off of you? So we get talking for 20, 30 minutes. I get home, and I'm a half hour late. And my wife goes, I, I thought you were going to be home a half hour ago. Now, I might feel challenged. And I might say, well, Carol, you know I'm a doctor. And Dr. Abrio stopped, and, and I've just invited conflict, maybe her intent was not to cause conflict. Maybe her intent was she's just worried that maybe she heard on the radio that there was a car accident on Highway 49. She was afraid it was me. So never assume you know uh, the intent of a, con of, a, of a comment that you view as being uh, threatening. And then there's a blame assumption. And that the blame assumption is assuming that the patient or the colleague is responsible for everything. <coughs> All right, now let's, we've talked about the what happened conversation. And as I said, I'll remind you again, these are all happen, happening concurrently. At the same time you're dealing with the what happened, you're dealing with emotions. Now, the Beatles said all you need is love. But the same year, the Rolling Stones said you can't always get what you want. So the Beatles had one emotion. They said that it will solve everything. But the Rolling Stones may have been more honest in that there's lots of different emotions that you're going to be dealing with. And we often seek to avoid the feelings conversation, don't we? How many of you like dealing with emotions? We don't. We feel that uh, feelings can cause harm and can interfere with rational thought, so I should be objective. And I can't fix feelings. I can't fix how Dr. Jordan feels about me, so why should I even try? And feelings may overwhelm me, and I don't want my feelings to show. I know I lose my temper if I let my feelings get away from me. So Mr. Spock, as you know, kind of would say it's not logical to let feelings cloud important discussions. But Mr. Spock forgot something very important, and that's that humans have amygdalae. And if he understood the concept of amyg amygdala hijacking that Daniel Goleman brought up in his book, Emotional Intelligence, he says it's not logical. Daniel Goleman says it's not logical to ignore emotions because they're going to come out. And uh, Kirk is not a Vulcan. He's a human, so he has an amygdala, and his emotions can explode. So the heart and soul of most difficult conversations is related to feelings. So we better learn how to experience them and combat them when they occur. So instead of saying 
we should ignore them because of amygdala hijacking. We should instead say, I need to address feelings without judgment. I have to, to be able to talk about what we're both feeling. And that, how do we do that? We use empathic communication skills. And I'll talk a little bit about that later, empathic probing. Our goal is to try to align with the emotion. And then we have to be mindful of our own feelings because we are bringing our feelings into it. So you can't control the wave. At best, you can anticipate it and attempt to ride it successfully. Because, you see, your patient has an amygdala. And you say something, you say, I'm sorry, I can't cure you. And they get upset. They say, what you promised you were going to be able to. They lose their temper. temper and now it affects you because you're a human and you're amygdala hijacks and you go, no, I never promised you that. And now all of a sudden, you're not problem solving, you're in conflict. And there's the identity conversation. And that's how do you see yourself and how do you see the other person? And could these views affect actions taken or perceived? How you see yourself and how you see your patient may set up the roles that you construct. My mom, who died recently, she was of the generation where doctors were the boss. And if, my, if a doctor would have said to my mom, Lorraine, we could do this or we could do that, what do you want to do? She would have freaked out because she was not used to that. She was used to the doctor saying, Lorraine, this is what we need to do. She would have been very unhappy if the doctor would have said, we could operate or we could give radiation. Which do you want? She would, have been, she would have said, I need another doctor. I want somebody to make the decision. But we know that more modern and younger people tend to look at doctors as being partners in healthcare. They'll say, I, I, I know you know about my disease, but I know about me. Can we be partners? And some people come to see, they, they're just looking for your opinion. They're not looking for you to engage anything. They're just saying, what do you think? They're looking for you as a health consultant. And if you assign the role, and we usually assign doctor-patient, there may be conflict if they don't like that role. And that's where you start seeing that word non-compliant all the time. What does pliable mean? It means to bend, right? It's pliable. What does compliant mean? to bend with. So if I say Dr. Davis is non-compliant, I'm saying she's not bending to my will. I've labeled her. I've given her a diagnosis. Instead, we should look at a patient who's not doing what you recommended as a symptom. And you have to explore why. Why is Dr. Davis not doing what I'm asking? Maybe she sees herself in a different role. Maybe she can't afford the medicine. I don't know. But if I just label her as non-compliant, I've set up the roles. And then there's in the identity conversation the you versus I statement. You statements focus on the pronoun you and imply that the recipient is responsible for something. Such statements demonstrate no ownership of emotions and are perceived as accusatory and may make the receiver feel defensive and resentful. So this would be a, um, an intern talking to the resident. The resident's on the cell phone. And the intern says, why are you sitting there playing with your phone and not helping me with these admissions? What did the intern just do? Made an accusatory statement, put the blame on the resident. How's the resident likely to respond? Say, OK, sure, I'll be glad to help you. What do you think the resident's likely to say? I'm not playing with my phone. I'm looking up uh, something on, you know, um, up to date. And now you've got conflict. So is there a better way instead of using a you statement? Well, the I statement focuses on the pronoun I and requires us to take responsibility for our interpretation of the actions. It allows us to be assertive without sounding hostile or accusatory. So our intern might have instead said to the resident, I'm feeling overwhelmed and I'd really appreciate some help with these admissions. So again. Dr. Abreu, you really look bored with my talk. Am I boring you? Okay, how's he likely to respond? Versus, Dr. Abreu, I sense that you're a little, you're working on something else. Perhaps um, I'm not 
you know, I'm talking to you about something you already understand or whatever. But by using an I, he, he has the right to say, no, I'm sorry, I, it's not that I'm not paying attention, it's just my mind is on that. Before I came down, I got an important phone call. It gives him the chance, and it's respectful. It's just saying, I sense that you're upset with me uh, versus why are you so angry? So try to avoid you statements and use I statements. Take ownership of your emotion. And ask yourself, why is this conversation getting to me? Why is this conversation going sideways? And be mindful that the three conversations that I've discussed are going on simultaneously. Ask yourself these questions. Am I acting as if I already know everything that I need to know? Am I making assumptions about the other person's intentions? And is the other person responsible for how I'm feeling at the moment? Which of my buttons are being pushed? So let's look at a, a ripe for conflict situation that I bet you everybody in this room has had some version of. So it's a common ripe for conflict scenario in the wards. Mrs. J is a 75-year-old woman who was admitted to the hospital with abdominal pain. And during the course of her evaluation, she has a CAT scan that revealed metastatic pancreatic carcinoma. The patient has a daughter who's adamant that no one should tell her mother that she has cancer. How many of you, before you walked in the room, got met by a family member or two saying, we don't want mama to know? Now, the conflict is that you have an opinion that the patient has the right to information about her illness, and you're basing that on the four principles of medical ethics. The first is respect for autonomy. The patient has the right to know what's going on and make their own decisions. And they can't have autonomy if they don't know what they're facing. So you've got a valid concern. But there's a family member, and they have an opinion of what they think is best for their mother. So why might the daughter not want her mother to be told? Why is this otherwise well-meaning person reacting in this challenging way? You recognize the impact of her challenge, but do you know the intent? <coughs> you think she's just wanting to be difficult when she says, don't tell mama she has cancer? Do you think that? That's probably not the case. But if you get into her face with talking about autonomy and mommy has the right to know, you're not going to win. So that's where we reach into our toolbox and look for empathic probing. We get them to feed back to us what they're feeling without asking them specifically what they're feeling. So instead of saying, why do you want to be this way, I'd say, so what do I need to know about your mom? She might say, well, my aunt just died six months ago, and I know mom took it real hard, so I know mom's not ready for it. I need to know that. Help me understand why it's so important that your mom not know about her cancer. Oh, I know my mom. She'll just give up and, and, and die. What are you afraid might happen if she knows? You're at least making them think. You're empathically probing. You're not challenging. You're just saying, let's think about these various issues. Can we think through what might happen next? Now, there's two pearls I'm going to share with you. We have lots of question words, why versus what and how. I'm going to ask you to get rid of the why question and go to the what and how question, and I'll show you why. If I say to the daughter, why don't you want your mom to know, what am I likely to hear? Because I don't want her to know, and I know my mom better than you do. Okay, I've not pushed her off her base. I haven't invited her to think further. Look what happens if I use what and how questions instead of the why question. What do you hope will happen if your mother is not told? I'm making her play chess. I'm making her think two moves ahead. She's stuck in her present move. I want her to think two moves ahead. So what do you hope will happen if your mom is not told? And look at the how question. How will we be able to treat her if she doesn't know what we are treating? Every cancer center that I know of has the word cancer center on it. So how is mom going to come to a treatment if, to get chemotherapy, if that's what you decide, if she doesn't understand she has cancer? So you've made them think two steps ahead, ooh, maybe this isn't such a good idea. Much better than why. Why don't you want your mom to know? Because I told you, and I, it's my mother, and I have the right. The other important 
Perl is knowing when to use but and when, knowing when to use and. Now look at this. I can see that you want the best for your mother, but not telling her what is going on may leave her more frightened. I put that in red to say that's a stop. The daughter's already told you if mom knows, I think something bad's going to happen. And you've said, but if we don't tell her, something bad's going to happen. She's going to be frightened. Well, left with two bad things happening, the daughter's going to say, well, going to be bad either way. I'll choose the bad I know best. I don't want mom to know. Look at the difference if I just change the word and. It forces me to change the structure of my sentence. Versus, I can see you want the best for your mother and telling her what is going on will leave her less frightened of the side effects of treatment. I've given her an off ramp. Because now she says, telling mom will be bad but actually telling mom may be good, and I've given, I've given her a chance to choose the good. So again, these are simple things, but it means being really mindful of the words you choose. And to have expert communication with difficult patients means you have to choose the right words. So in these kinds of things, don't use why, use what and how. Don't use but, use and. Don't try to convince the family that they're wrong. Don't ask them what they want to do, because they'll tell you what they want to do. And your job is to try to nudge them to what you want to do. And don't forget to address the three layers that are going on at once. So you're going to run into conflict, but the pivot point is how you respond once you recognize it. If you habitually withdraw, you're not giving it your best. If you feel like you've got to win every time, you're going to create resentment. So the first step to diffuse a conflict once you sense it's going on, is to notice it. You have to, if you don't notice it, you can't diffuse it. And it's an internal step. You might notice that you're becoming irritated, angry, or detached. You might notice your own defensive body language. You can ignore the conflict, but you run the risk that it's going to raise its head again in a more eruptive form. Then you want to find a non-judgmental starting point. If I say, Dr. Todd, you're really getting angry. You need to calm down. Again, I'm putting the blame on him versus me saying, Dr. Todd, can we talk about what's happening here? We're acknowledging uh, we're in conflict right now. Can we talk about what's happening here? It's a good way to let the amygdala cool down a little bit. And be mindful. You need to pause before rushing to judgment. You need to create some space for the other person. Don't box them in. So we want to ask to listen and hear their story first. We all want to tell our story first. First, it's not respectful. Say, can you tell me what you're feeling and what, why, why you think it's a good idea not to tell mom? Please share your thoughts about this with me. But be mindful. Don't start mentally preparing your rebuttal while the other person is speaking. Let's do another ex experiment. Some of you who know this just don't do it. Those of you who don't. I'm going to send several very quick questions at you, and I want you to answer as fast as you can as a group. Spell joke. Spell poke. What do we call the white of an egg? Yolk. Do we call the white of an egg yolk? No. So what we, we got lost in the moment. We were thinking of what the next thing is, and we heard poke, joke, so we figured it had to rhyme with it. So there's always somebody in the group would say yolk. They were not mindful of the moment. They didn't create space for the person. They weren't listening to what I was saying. They were listening to what they kind of felt was supposed to occur. So the next step is to identify what the conflict is about and articulate it as a shared interest. So we want to align values. We are both interested in, start off with that, not that I'm right and you're wrong, so it sounds like we're both interested in doing what's best for your mother. And then offer another perspective. May I share with you my perspective on this or my take on this? And then brainstorm options. Could we list the available options and spend a few minutes discussing the pros and cons of each? Again, this is incredibly respectful. You're normalizing and validating the, the family's concerns or the patient's concerns. You're saying, I'm sure you've got some important reasons for wanting this. Can we talk about it? And then look for the options and recognize the interests of all. 
So, like we said, if you remember my Thomas Kilman model, we'd love to collaborate, make it win-win, so attempt to collaborate. I want us to find an option that we can all be comfortable with where we both win. But you can't always get that, so then attempt to compromise. Perhaps we could consider trying whatever intervention you want. We can always reevaluate and change course if we aren't satisfied with the result. We are kind of kicking the can down the road. So you could say, instead of tube putting in a tube to force feed mom, maybe we could just give her some IV hydration, see if that perks her up, maybe to lower her calcium, maybe she'll eat. But if after a few days that hasn't worked, we should reconsider. It gives them time to evaluate all their options. And remember that some conflicts cannot be resolved. Remember, we're discussing ways to diffuse conflict, not to eradicate it. If you want a job where there's never conflict, don't do this job. Not all conflict is resolved the way everyone likes. And sometimes you have to agree to disagree. Aristotle said there's only one way to avoid conflict. That's do nothing, say nothing, and be nothing. And I don't think that's what we want to do as physicians. So our goal is to get from this point of view to this. Any questions? Did this help in any way? Do you, do you, can you think of the last person you've had conflict with where you might now have approached it differently? If not, and I've wasted my time. I'm hopeful I gave you some tools to at least step back and when you're recognizing conflict, say, what's going on here and how do I best deal with this? Are there any questions or thoughts or comments? Yes? I know I've, I've really prolonged things, but uh, it seems like there might be a lot of conflicts now if you're talking to someone about a vaccination, but it'd be something as simple as flu vaccine or pneumonia vaccine or especially measles vaccine. Right, and that's why my last one, which you can't, can't resolve every conflict. My wife and I, um, we have one political opinion. Her family, a lot of them, have a very different political viewpoint. And when we went up for the holidays, we agreed. We have a little plan. If somebody in the family at Thanksgiving brings up politics, my cue to my wife was, honey, you want another piece of pie? And we'd get up and leave. We'd avoid it. We're not getting into this because we're not going to win. Whichever side of the divide I'm on, I am not going to convince the person who's on the other side that they're wrong. So why even do that? So I'd say sometimes you can ask, can you share with me what you understand about vaccinations? If they say, well, I've heard that it can cause autism. I've heard that. There may be an opening to say, well, can I share with you what I know? And MMR vaccines have been around forever and blah, blah, blah. Um, but if they say, because I don't want my kid to get autism, and they're like this, you're probably not going to win. You can still ask, may I share with you? But that may be one you have to walk away and, and then depend on if the legal system, like in New York where they say you got to get vaccinated, um, then you can refer to the legal system. But Keep in mind, you're not going to always win. It's like politics, you know. You, you just can't win everything, so you have to know when to hold them and when to fold them. Any other thoughts or questions? So I want to comment on a couple of things. I think a lot of times what gets people in trouble is their tone of voice, which triggers the emotional response. And so I think that if you can talk about the emotional response, and you can pick it up very quickly from their tone or their body language, what you need to do. The other thing, having shadowed a lot of residents and faculty, Sometimes I think when they get scared or they have a patient they are perceiving it's difficult, they over explain, they get in the weeds, and they get full of jargon uh, and trying to explain what they hope the patient will do. You're absolutely right. Um, so if you're emotional and you're saying, I just want mom to be fed, and I start feeding biotechnical jargon at you, I'm in one, you're in the emotional, you're talking to me with your emotions. And I should be able to pick that up by your tone and body language. But I'm responding with cognitive based data. And that's oil and water, it's not going to myth. 
So yes, a lot of doctors will try to over-explain using biotechnical jargon, but I like to r remind people that our patients don't understand our jargon. Um, I'm making a stereotype about myself and maybe the other men in this room, but I grew up in a generation where men were supposed to know about cars, how to fix a car. I know nothing about it. I've got a wife and a bunch of daughters, and if we're in the car and it starts making funny noise, we go to the service department, and I tell them what it's doing. If the repairman says, well, it sounds like your anchor shackles discombobulated from your muck clucks, I'm going to sit there and go, yeah, that's what I thought. Why am I doing that? I don't want to look stupid. He's already talking to me in what Dr. Davis calls the bio, the technical aspects. And he's saying it in a way that I should know. And I don't want to look stupid in front of my wife and kids. So I'll go, yeah, that's what I thought. Instead of just saying, what the hell are you talking about? I don't understand. And so when we, we've all been in the situation where we talk to a, a patient, say, well, you've got obstructive jaundice because the perinodal ampullary nodes are involved with this pancreatic cancer, so the bile can't get out. That's why you're itching and turning. I am giving them a technical description of what's going on that another doctor or medical student would understand, but they don't. But what's the likelihood they're going to say, what the hell are you talking about? They'll say, OK. I walk out the room, and I don't even make it to the elevator when the nurse comes running out saying, Dr. Marion, Mrs. Jones and her family are very, they don't know what's going on. Oh, I just told them what's going on. They understood go back in and say, Ms. Jones, the nurse says you didn't understand. Yeah, I kind of did it. Can you tell me again? So a lot of times we do exactly that. We try to get out of the conflict by using biotechnical jargon. And what was the first comment? Tone. Yeah, tone. And that's why I remember I said my, one of my first slides was about confirmation bias. If I say, Dr. Scarborough, can you head down to the ER? We got that sickler who gets admitted three times every month and he's got obvious drug-seeking behavior. You walk down there with a tone of voice, don't you, in body language. So what are you doing here? Looks like you just got discharged a week ago, now you're back. I've already told you what you're supposed to feel. I've labeled this patient. And now you go down there, and if I came up to you, you're the patient, say, so why are you here? They just sent you home a week ago with a whole month full of narcotics. She sees my tone of voice, and she turns away. She's not making eye contact. And so she gets angry, I get angry. So that's why we should never label patients, and that's why I did the retake on my title. Let's not talk about difficult patients. Let's talk about difficult patient encounters. It's not the patient's fault always. Sometimes it's our fault. So yeah, to avoid the t even if somebody's preempted you, told you that this is a hateful patient, go in there and try kindness. Say, hi, Ms. Jones. I, I see that you've been admitted to the hospital a bunch. This must really suck to have to be admitted so often. You wouldn't say that to an 85-year-old woman, but a 22-year-old woman, you might say this really sucks to have to be admitted so often, or certainly this is terrible. Just show a little empathy. And my, maybe they'll respond to you differently and let you know that they've got a new symptom and you find out they have osteomyelitis of the bone. It's not just a typical sickle crisis. And as you all know, I don't like the word sickler. That is a derogatory term. Please say patient with sickle cell. But if somebody says to you, go see that sickle down in the ER, you can, be in, you can anticipate that they're likely to have a negative comment about you. Any other comments? Yes. Oh, I thought. Oh, sorry. Wait, you know, I'm sorry. Okay, well, thank you then very much.